Good evening here in New York. This is Joshua Walker at Japan Society. I'm not dressed like I normally am because today I'm particularly excited to welcome you to the fight for women's judo, Rusty Kanakogi's story. Uh, I'm basically just here to tell our sponsors thank you, the Talks Plus season sponsors, Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group, as well as an anonymous donor and the Sandy Heck Lecture Fund. But the more important and exciting side is the story that we're going to hear tonight. I, I can't tell you how excited I am to hear this story myself. I've been hearing about it for a while. Rusty Kanokogi was born in Brooklyn, New York, and trained at the Kodokan Judo Institute in Japan that anyone who knows anything about judo knows is the gold standard. She's known as the mother of women's judo and spent her life fighting for equality in judo. Due in great part to her efforts, women's judo became an official Olympic sport in 1992. It seems particularly relevant to kick off Japan society's passing the torch series as we get ready for the Tokyo Olympics in a couple of months. And today to tell Rusty's story in some ways, in her own words, uh, is, is her daughter, Dr. Jean Kanakogi. She herself is a fifth uh, degree black belt in judo. She says she kind of was born into it. She's also a former member of the U.S. national judo team that you might get to see in action tonight uh, from her presentation. But most importantly, besides being her daughter, uh, she also brings uh, Rusty's life to us tonight to share this incredible story. Uh, and she's authored uh, her book, Get Up and Fight, the memoir of uh, Rena Rusty Kanakogi, the mother of women's judo. If you haven't checked out this book, please please go check it out. You'll get to figure out why this story that we're going to only just scratch the surface of today is so needed for this moment in time. We all need to have a fighter like Rusty in our corner. So I can't wait to learn along with all of you. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kanakogi. Jean, let me turn it over to you. Thank you again for, for being here to tell the story. Thank you so much, Dr. Walker. And thank you, Japan Society sponsors and all attendees for welcoming me into your homes tonight. I am going to introduce you for an overview and take you through some of Rusty's journey. So bear with me, I will share screen and start this presentation with you. I am Jean Kanakogi and I grew up with Rusty as my mentor, my coach and my mother. I didn't realize what a gold mine of experience this was. I lived and was part of history of her story. Having Rusty in your corner, you had no choice but to know your potential and pass it. I grew up in Brooklyn. As uh, Dr. Walker had mentioned, I'm a former member of the US judo team, a fifth degree black belt in judo. I've had a 23 year and I'm still active career in federal law enforcement. I was a 9-11 first responder. I have a PhD in psychology, and now I volunteer as the director of mental health and peer support for the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association and Blue Hearts for Heroes. Here's a fun fact. I took second place in the Nathan's hot dog eating contest. So during the opening questions and answers, please, somebody ask me about it because there's a funny story to it. So let's get this presentation started. Rusty grew up in Coney Island in the 1940s and 1950s. Back then, Coney Island was New York's oldest tourist attractions, but it wasn't just an amusement park. People lived there and it was really a flourishing neighborhood. As Rusty emerged from an early tumultuous childhood, she was tough and ready to make her mark on the world. Starting on the streets of Coney Island, where she led a girl gang called the Apaches. But during this rough upbringing, she developed her own philosophy. You don't mess with parents, cops, or teachers. Anyone else that bugs you, you kick their butt. Given that Coney Island was an amusement park, they had various shows, and one sadly was called The Freak Show. 
the two stars of the freak show was, were Rusty's babysitters. And this is where she started to learn. You never judge a book by its cover. Judge people by their character, how they treat you, how they make you feel, and how you treat others. Well, they made Rusty feel special. They loved her as part of their own family. She saw firsthand how people were treating other people just for looking different, just for being different. But Rusty identified with them because Rusty was different. She was bigger and stronger than most. As Rusty grew up, she started going down the wrong path. She made some poor choices, had some run-ins with the law, and she even was in a bad first marriage. However, her bad first marriage led her to joining Al-Anon to support her husband at the time. She met a friend at Al-Anon and he looked like he worked out. So she was interested in asking him what he did to stay physically fit. He told her he did judo. And at that point, she had no idea what judo was. This was about 1955. He said, well, let me show you. And he did a hip throw, picked her up on her hip, on his hip. And she was like, wow, I have to do this. He picked me up like a piece of paper. So she followed him to his judo class at the Prospect Park YMCA in Brooklyn. However, women were not allowed to practice judo. She kept on showing up. And finally, they let her in the class. And here was the deal that they made. She can learn judo on one day, but she has to turn around and teach judo to the women the next day. So she agreed. And finally, they embraced her. They said, wow, you know what? This strong woman can do judo. She was part of a team. And this team went to fight at, or compete at the Utica YMCA Judo Championships in 1959. She took a medal. Uh, I'm sorry. She took a place of one of the team members that were hurt. So she had to compete against a man. So she thought, oh boy, what do I do now? I have to compete against a man. So she wanted to downplay the fact that she was a woman. Well, she put an ace bandage around her chest, changed in a broom closet again, because there were no, no places for women to change, put on her judo gi, which is her judo uniform. And she stepped on the mat. Well, her coach told her, well, just, just pull a draw. Don't pull any attention to yourself. But as she stepped on the mat, she thought, well, I train just as hard as these guys. Why can't I have my shot? Why can't I compete? So she tried so hard to hold back, but that really didn't work in Rusty's, Rusty's personality. She heard her team cheering her on and she came in and on a throw and threw her opponent, a big, strong man for a full point and won her match. Well, she was so excited because now she was going to get a gold medal instead of a citation for fighting. But the tournament director found out that she was a woman and the tournament director approached her and began a conversation that sounded like this. What I'm going to do is play you the raw file of the audiobook of the rest of this scene. And by the way, uh, for the book, Get Up and Fight, that Dr. Walker had mentioned, we are creating the audiobook as well. But here's the raw file of this scene when, her when she was approached by the tournament director. Are you a girl? He asked in a low tone out of earshot of the others. I know you're a girl. Then he added in a snide, guttural, condescending tone that it was illegal for me to compete because women were not allowed to compete. My first thought was this jerk didn't even give me the recognition for being a woman and referred to me simply as a girl. In my head, I mimicked his same snide tone and I asked him if he were a cow because his question was so outlandish. In reality, I kept my mouth shut. Judo had taught me to choose my battles. My heart was racing. I felt tears welling up in my eyes, not from sadness, but from boiled anger. But I kept listening. I held in those tears. No one could think I was soft, not even now. He told me if I accepted the first place medal, my team would be disqualified and would have to forfeit their win and their trophy we had rightfully earned. I was shaking inside. My heart dropped to the floor. My breathing was labored, but I showed nothing to him. He and his rule makers did not deserve 
any emotion from me. This was all done quietly. No other tournament officials knew about it, but I told Coach Evoy. He exclaimed that the team would all give their medals back, but I insisted that that would make the situation even worse because these medals were all won fair and square. I went back to the tournament director and agreed in as casual a way as I could muster. I would not accept the medal, my medal, my very first win. I handed him my cherished medal. At that moment, I felt like I did everything wrong just by being a female. I was heartbroken. As I uttered the words of declination, I realized that this moment would be one of those pivotal occasions, not just in my life, but in the lives of women in judo and other sports around the world. No woman shall ever suffer such an indignity ever again, I told myself. I will make sure of it. I was going to change judo history. So the, some of the first steps to change judo history in 1962, Rusty went to Japan to study at the Kodokan. She was placed on the woman's side and learned a lot of great kata from Ms. Keiko Fukuda. They became very good friends and they respected each other. Learning kata gave Rusty some fantastic judo foundations, but she wanted more. She wanted to train with the men. She wanted a combative forum. The senseis at the Kodokan didn't know exactly what to do with this five foot nine, red, boisterous redhead woman from New York. So what did they do? They allowed her on the men's side of the dojo. And here is where she embodies the mantra, fall down seven, get up eight, because she paid her dues. She gained the respect of her male training partners. She trained in the international section of the dojo with 1964 Olympians, Jim Bregman and Ben Nighthorse Campbell. She even tested and passed for her Nidon, which is her second degree black belt, before Risei Kano, the son of Professor Jigoro Kano, the father of Judo. While at the Kodokan, Rusty's training allowed her to make several very good friends. She made one very special friend, Yohei Kanakogi, my father. Yohei had the opportunity to go anywhere in the world to teach judo. And after Rusty left Japan, he decided, I'm going to New York. I'm going to go to New York to find Rusty and teach judo. Well, he found her. He found her and he married her in 1964. Not too long after that, a few years after that, the little one in the hoodie, uh, that's me. Here I am. Not only did Yohei bring judo to New York and to America, he brought karate to luggage. Samsonite versus Kano Koji. Samsonite makes over 400 styles of tough bags. Samsonite's got your back. Not only did Rusty get herself so involved in judo, but she really tried to give us a family experience, uh, the regular family experience. And we went to Disneyland or Disney World pretty much every year growing up because she absolutely loved Disney. This was her escape. This was her happy place. Ergo, the happiest place on earth. But while she was still, while she was taking us to on the rides, she was still fighting for equality. Her mind never stopped. She also spent time with her aunt out in East Hampton because family was so important to her. Her aunt is Lee Krasner Pollock, the abstract artist and wife of Jackson Pollock. As a matter of fact, her aunt Lee, my great aunt, was portrayed by Marsha Gay Harden and won an Oscar for that performance. Rusty and Marsha became very good friends and, and Marsha and I became very good friends. She's just a wonderful person. And let me let Marsha tell you her thoughts about Rusty. Uh, one of the last chapters of Rusty's life, she would become confidant and advisor to Hollywood stars. 
uh, Rusty invited me to come out to meet her so we could talk about Lee Krasner. And uh, if I was there, I would tell you this story, so I'll tell you this story from here in Canada. I came into the driveway, and I actually had thought Rusty, because I'd heard her voice, and I didn't know it was her niece. It was a relative, I was told. I thought it was a guy, um, because Rusty had that deep voice. And I came into the driveway, and I saw Rusty and Kano, and they invited me inside, and Rusty immediately uh, invited me to lie down on the bed where Lee Krasna had, had slept if I wanted to, or I could uh, go through the closet where I might find a moo moo, a Lee Krasna moo moo, and I could wear it if I wanted to. And we sat down at the table and had some tea, and Connor nodding the whole time. And then she said, uh, Marsha, if you want to play Lee Krasna, you have to start screaming from the minute you walk through the door to the minute you leave. Then she smiled. She said, actually, if you want to play Lee Krasna, Lee was strongly matter of fact, strongly matter of fact. And I kept that with me because I didn't really know what that meant. I, I'm not strongly matter of fact. I'm, you know, every emotion possible is on my sleeve. So I took it back to Ed and Ed said, strongly matter of fact. I like that. Yeah. So he always would use that word, strongly matter of fact, when he was directing me as Lee Krasner. And um, I actually think that those words, Gene, uh, helped Pollock a little bit when we, when we were released, helped us to get some notice. Um, I just uh, want to say what a great lady your mom was and your wife was, Kano, and how she, in a heartbeat, opened herself up to the film, to me, and uh, became a friend over time. And she never stopped talking about you, Jean, how proud she was of you, and how much she loved you, Kano. And for this great woman who had done great things for women everywhere, and judo, and had a title, and reclaimed a title recently, um, I just feel like she's still here because someone of that size in every way, that heart, that brain, those guts, that voice, um, they, they don't disappear into the, the golden gates. She's here and her, her legend lives on long after her. So I'm really grateful that she was my friend. Rusty kept her crusade for equality. She teamed up with Billie Jean King and the Women's Sports Foundation and Gina Davis to fight for Title IX for equality. So Rusty was a mother. She was a wife. And she was not only a mother to me, but a mother to so many. She was our coach. She was our sensei. But then she and my dad opened our dojo in Brooklyn. It was probably in one of the toughest neighborhoods in Brooklyn in Flatbush Avenue. It was so tough, they even spelled the name of the sign wrong. But knowing Rusty, she probably got a discount for that. It was our little dojo in Brooklyn, and it was named after the Southern Islands in Japan where my father grew up. My father is from Kumamoto Kyushu, and that's where many great judokas are from. Speaking of great judokas, we had visitors from all around the world. Misty Yamashita from Japan visited our dojo. Radomir Kovacevic, another Olympian, visited and stayed with us in our dojo. We had Ingrid Bergmans from Belgium, Christo Christina Fiorentini from Italy, and Grace Jividen and Eve Arnoff Travella training in our dojo. But Rusty always tells you she couldn't do all that she did without her Brooklyn attitude. This attitude is what kept her determined to make Olymp women's judo an Olympic sport. This is an excerpt from the movie, Blue in the Face, Up in Smoke by Harvey Keitel. The Brooklyn attitude, as far as I'm concerned, is first, knowing what you're doing, being right and following through and never stop following through on what you believe in. And um, if you have to defend it, Physically, verbally, spiritually, whatever way you have to defend it is, is if you, Brooklyn people are always ready to pay the price for what they believe in. And um, it's being upfront and following through and not taking any crap from anybody. And you can only imagine how much crap Rusty did not take because she was successful. But in order for women's judo to become an Olympic sport, the world championships had to be held. There was virtually no support in the United States at that time, but for the people in our dojo. So after they told Rusty a, a world championship was needed to even be considered 
to include women's judo in the Olympics, she said, fine, I'll do it. And after saying that she was going to hold the first women's world judo championships, it was almost like a schoolyard challenge because the US judo back then kind of egged her on and these decision makers said, oh yeah, well, where are you going to have these world championships? Sort of mocking her. And she looked them dead in the face and said, oh really, I am going to hold these at Madison Square Garden. And as the words came out of her mouth and she couldn't pull them back, she also realized that she only had about $146 in the bank account. So what did Rusty do? She came to judo practice that night. We were all lined up to bow in and she announced, we're holding a world championships. We all just looked at each other and followed our sensei and said, okay, where do we start? What do we do? So the first, one of the first things about the world championships was to have a logo and Rusty was all about authenticity. She wanted a logo to be so authentic. She asked two of her students to throw each other probably almost a thousand times to get the right shot. Another one of her students was a professional photographer who took the photos. And as you see, our logo is an authentic throw of two of her students. And that was the logo used for the first Women's World Judo Championships. Again, having very little support to almost no support, lots of lots of fundraising had to happen. Rusty also reached out to the International Judo Federation. And at the time, the president, Dr. Shigeyoshi Matsumai, came through and offered his support because he believed that women needed to be in the Olympics. Rusty and Dr. Matsumai became very good friends over time because of their beliefs. They both believed in peace, unity, and education. And Dr. Matsumai was the founder of Tokai University. And he also believed in Rusty. So in their getting together and beliefs, they believed that the Japanese judo women needed more international experience to compete. So they said, let's have a championships and international championships in Japan so that the Japanese uh, women's judo team could compete on their home turf. In 1983, Rusty along with Dr. Matsumai and RKB Minichi got together and held the first Fukuoka championships. This is still revered and talked about by so many competitors and see if you could find me in these opening ceremonies. 大会 I feel like I'm watching my childhood as I play these slides and see if you could find me in this picture. But she believed because of the first women's world judo championships and because of the Fukuoka cup and because of all of the other international tournaments such as the British Open and other tournaments that women's judo had a good shot of being included in the 1984 Olympics, but she was told no. Rust no was not part of Rusty's vocabulary. She sued for the inclusion of women's judo to be included in the Olympic Sports Festival, and she won, but they weren't quite there yet. So Rusty went to the 1984 Olympics, teamed up with the American Civil Liberties Union, and tried to even put an injunction on the entire Olympics because of discrimination. And this is why, this is why Rusty believed 
that this was so important. To see a dream come true, to enable women judo to uh, become an Olympic sport because they deserve it. They, not only the United States, but all the women throughout the world that train their guts out for judo or any sport, they deserve it. They do. They absolutely deserve it. And Rusty wasn't stopping. And now that you've gotten to know a little bit about Rusty, I'm going to have Rusty introduce herself to you through this video. I nailed this flasher and put an armor on him. I'm going to take him to the, to the transit police station, marched him, very proud of myself. One big mistake, I forgot to have him close his fly. Don't punch the side of the head, to the meaty part of the face, which is known as eyes, mouth. And with one little pop, you can break somebody's nose very easily. When I think about it, I guess it was judo that really saved my life. Right. It really got me turned on. I had a friend who was uh, smaller than I, and I can usually handle. And uh, this guy had taken a class at Hawaii and did some judo. And when he picked me up on his hip like I was a piece of paper, that was it. This was magic to me. I could always fight, but this was something really different. The men I worked with at the time, they really didn't know how to take me. But uh, I think it was my trying spirit that really let them work with me. And I was one of the people selected to be on the official team from that Y. And um, I wanted to make sure that there weren't any problems. So I took an ace bandage and uh, wrapped up my uh, chest pretty tight. And my hair was short at the time. And no one was wise to it until um, uh, I think after I competed and I won, then I was taken aside and taken into a room and said, look, we don't want to embarrass you. We know you're a girl and uh, uh, your team will be disqualified unless you give your individual medal back. So, of course, I did. My teacher, who's Japanese, uh, recommended that uh, I go and train in Japan. To me, it was like being dead and in heaven. It's the Mecca. It's the homeland. I was there that I met my husband. Yohei has been supportive from day one. Uh, in fact, I don't know how he's tolerated me. I don't know how he's lived with me. I don't know. I think um, if there was such a thing as a judo saint, he should get it. Ow, ow, ow. Almost nine. It was over. That's out. So she make me dizzy because she's so busy every day from morning to night time. Oh, you know I got a bad luck, Tom. And I don't know, sir. Next day or next week, what's going on? Because telephone call from all over the world, and uh, she does follow all for women judo, and she handled. I don't know how she handled very good, and not only for the judo, for the house, for my kids, and she cooked very good for my Japanese food too. I've sent several letters to Ted Turner with no response, trying to find out why women's judo was not included in the Goodwill Games. My name is Rusty Kanakogi from Brooklyn, New York. My schedule starts uh, usually 7 o'clock in the morning unless I receive an international call and then can start at 5.30, answer the phones, get some letters out, teach. Sometimes I have three or four classes in different locations a day. There's always the next project. There's always something cooking. They don't pick on the strong, they pick on the weak. And each time, each time you giggle and each time you cheat on your exercise, that's another reason to get picked on. Do you understand? You don't have to look like Hercules to have strong shoulders. If your body's strong, your brain is strong, your will is strong, then maybe you can get along in life with everything. I teach judo self-defense at FIT. You gotta teach the kids how to handle themselves. Get rid of the muggers. From here, stop! He's not gonna bother anybody anymore. There's an arm around your neck. Here's your position. Nice guy. Starts to strangle you from here. No! Throw him away. You don't need anyone hanging on you. When you love something, when you are madly in love and never get out of love with it, to see it succeed, to see it proud, it's like going through life, paying the heaviest dues humanly possible, seeing a dream come true. And then she thought women's judo had a good chance to get into the 1988 Olympics. But again, they told her no. She fought and she sued 
and she threatened and she got as much support as possible. And then what happened? Victory. She was told that women's judo will be included in the 1988 Olympic Games. So proudly, she walked in as the Olympic coach with her team, and that was her gold medal. Walking into that stadium that she knew forever history would be changed. Rusty was so proud to be in Seoul. Every woman there, she believed, was part of history. This was a huge victory for women, not only in judo, but in general and in sports. It was such a huge victory. But Rusty reminds us what she was willing to do to get women's judo in the Olympics. Into the Olympic Games. I mean, I probably would have sold my house, my children, <laughs> rented out my husband, whatever. Well, I don't think I was sold and I don't think she rented out my dad, but she would have if it, matter, if it was a matter of getting women's judo into the Olympic Games. She went on to referee at the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. In 2004, she did the color commentary in Athens. And in 2008, she was awarded the Japanese Order of the Rising Sun Gold Rays with Rosette for her contributions to pr the promotion of Japanese culture and to judo. 50 years after they took her medal away in Utica, New York in 1959, for being a woman and beating a man because women weren't allowed, the YMCA righted a wrong and they gave her medal back. Uh, for after uh, 50 years, I'm getting a medal. Should have never been taken away from me. It was, but we're righting a wrong. So that's what counts. Uh, soon after uh, this whole negative experience, I didn't dwell on it, I just kept moving on. And that's a lesson that we could all take. If something bad happens, you don't dwell on it, you learn from it and you keep moving on. Rusty's ash, Rusty passed away in 2009 and her ashes are interred in, a, in Kumamoto Kyushu. And in this interment, it states, Rusty Kanakogi, American Samurai, 1935 to 2009. Kumamoto is a very special place because that's where my father is from, but his lineage goes all the way back to Jokshin Kanakogi, one of the samurai of Japan, and the Kumamoto Castle was formerly known sometime in the 1500s as the Kanakogi Castle. So needless to say, I tried going back and reclaiming it as my castle, but it really just didn't work. Uh, I'm still to this day trying to say I'm, I'm a princess of the Kumamoto Castle. Uh, in Kumamoto, the Chuo High School judo team goes every so often to pray at Rusty's, at Rusty's interment site and bring her a cup of fresh coffee because Rusty always insisted upon a fresh cup of coffee. But they also are very grateful because any one of these students, any one of these young women can aspire to be an Olympian because Rusty paved the way for them. Dr. Paul Beersford Hill is the ambassador to Malta and he and Rusty were very much aligned because they believed in youth and education. I'll let Paul Hill tell you a little bit about his thoughts on Rusty. Our commonality was a belief in the power of education to change young people for the better. Rusty did it her way through the self-discipline of judo, through encounters steeped in ritual and history, stressing a fundamental regard for others, which was all about taming the inner person, all about self-control, and all about respect for your opponent. It's all about respect. Now, we just talked about the history of women's judo. So let's see if anybody at home can answer this Jeopardy question. This was a question on Jeopardy, or an answer rather, on Jeopardy in 2016. Rusty Kanakogi threw herself into making this martial art a demonstration sport in Seoul. That's right, women's judo. In 2018, Rusty was inducted into the International Judo uh, Federation's Hall of Fame. She is the first American woman to have such an esteemed honor in this Hall of Fame. 
In 2019, the corner of West 17th and Surf Avenue in Coney Island, Brooklyn was co-named after Rusty. It is now Rena Rusty Kanakogi Way. So Rusty again got her way. This street is right in front of the ball field on Surf Avenue, not too far from Nathan's and not too far from where she grew up. Uh, down the block, if you ever visit Coney Island, you'll also see a gigantic parachute jump. And that's one of, that was one of Rusty's favorite rides. And it stands still strong and tall today. Every time I look at it, I still can't believe my mother jumped off of that thing. But my father reassures me that it was true because he held her bag while she did it. The street sign naming was celebrated all around the world. It was such a huge celebration. And speaking of celebrations, this year, uh, in 2020, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the first Women's World Judo Championships. This was so huge, people were still talking about it today. And as a matter of fact, the same scales that some of the boxers, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, weighed in on are the same scales that these women weighed in, weighed in on to compete in the first Women's World Judo Championships. In part of the celebration, the International Judo Federation created a memorial video, and I'd like to share it with you. Hi, everybody. I'm Frank Lieber, and welcome to Madison Square Garden's Felt Forum for a truly historic event in women's sports, the first World Women's Judo Championship. 27 nations on hand competing in eight different weight classifications and working with me is Rusty Kanakogi herself, a former coach of the U.S. women's team and an organizer of this event. And I know this is a proud and happy moment for you. It certainly is and we're very delighted to have you here cover our event and it's a history being made, the beginning of the advanced movement towards the Olympics for women's judo. So let's talk a little bit about the book, Get Up and Fight, appropriately named Get Up and Fight, because it's something I used to hear from my mom all the time, on and off the mat. And it, it's so appropriate because your get up and fight doesn't necessarily have to be a physical fight. Whatever it is that's obstructing your path, you need to get up and fight. And that was Rusty's message, because Rusty's story is not just a story about judo. It's a story about empowerment. It's a story to get you to get up and fight. Billie Jean King and Rusty became very good friends over the years. Again, both aligned for equality. And Billie wrote the foreword for this book. Let's hear her thoughts about Rusty. Hi, everyone. Guess what I got today? I got the, the Rusty Connie Kogi story that her daughter wrote, Jean. It is fantastic. I loved Rusty Kanakogi. She, we always have known her as the mother of women's judo. We would not have women's judo in the United States without Rusty Kanakogi. So I want everyone to have a chance to look, uh, look it up. It's called Get Up and Fight. Uh, I can't wait to, to even read it. I just got it. Uh, but I just wanted to let everybody know how wonderful I thought she was and how important she is to the history um, of really the sports history of the United States, but particularly for judo. And she also helped women's judo get in the Olympics. 
our friend Yamaguchi-san from Tokai University brought Rusty's book to the statue at Tokai University to show Dr. Matsumai. This meant so much to us because of Dr. Matsumai's deep support for equality, for empowering others, for education, and for Rusty. Thank you everybody for your attention and letting me share this overview of the story of Rusty Kanakogi. Now, if you want the book of the 40th anniversary special edition, we still have some that you can get autographed if you visit our website, rustykanakogi.com. And my contact information is below on the slide. What I'd like to do now is turn it over to our host, Tomomi, and open for questions and answers. Well, thank you, Dr. Kanakogi, for your fascinating presentation. And thank you to everyone who's joined, who's joining us for this virtual program. I'm Tomomi Sekia, Director of the Talks Plus program at Japan Society. At this point, we'd like to take some questions from the audience. And we have been compiling questions from the chat. So we will start with those. If you have anything you would like to ask Dr. Kanokogi, please enter your question in the chat now. OK, so the first question for you is, what do you think is the biggest misconception about judo in the US today? What do you wish people understand about judo? I think people should understand that judo, people think that it's such an individual sport because you go out there and you're competing one on one, but it truly is a team sport and a camaraderie sport where you have to build uh, on your, with your teammates to be able to deliver a perfect performance and to, to, to be able to build upon your skills. So I think the misconception is that judo is, is solely individual and almost selfish, but it, it's actually, actually selfless because it's the mutual benefit for all. Yeah, and uh, my personal wish is that we could easily watch judo and Olympic on NBC, you know, because uh, it's like a featured program in Japan, but obviously not in the States yet. So hopefully, you know, in the prime time, maybe we could see judo, women's judo, especially. It's pretty hard to be able to watch that on the broadcast in the States yet. Um, what is the one thing that you want people to remember your mother for the most? Uh, well, if they knew her, they would definitely, <laughs> she would be unforgettable. But I would like Rusty to be remembered for being fair and always fighting for, for what's being fair, uh, for fairness, for the underdog, and that she never wanted more. She would not accept less. She only wanted to be fair. And I think through her strength and through her determination, and again, like she said in, in the clip, not taking any crap from anyone, uh, she needs to be remembered just like that. Yeah, the, all the videos you put together are so incredible and very fascinating, you know, <laughs> to see her personality and everything. And, and has judo helped you outside of the dojo in your personal or professional life? Of course, of <laughs> course. Uh, judo helped me significantly when, uh, when I thought I was going to run out of gas internally, when, when I was challenged the most. Uh, in judo, when I competed, I fought, I trained, and I had to reach deep inside for my, for my get up and fight. I remember there were matches where somebody choked me and instead of giving up, I decided to keep fighting and I turned blue, but I stood back up uh, and was able to compete. Uh, after the attacks of September 11th and I was working round the clock, I didn't know if I had how much get up and fight I had to carry on my duties and continue digging and carry out my work duties. So I dug deep down inside and my judo training continued my get up and fight. Yeah, that's a great lesson in life in anyhow. And obviously, you know, in your professional life, it's very important. Um, and uh, I, I didn't actually realize your father, Ryohei, had a little karate background on the TV commercial life, but uh, what were some differences in judo teaching or training method between your mother and father? 
Uh, it, it was a it was very different because my father was smaller by nature, uh, not that much smaller than my mom, maybe an inch or two shorter, but his technique was a more of a precision technique. So I actually was so lucky because not only did I get, I inherit his genes for being able to do precision techniques in judo, but my mom's technique were more grand, were larger and, and boisterous in nature. So I learned her judo technique. So they had small differences. And the really great thing is that women's bodies are different. We have a lower center of gravity. So I really got to understand the mechanics between my mom teaching judo and my dad teaching judo and fully understanding a lot of the physiology, the kinesiology, and also the mindset. So I really benefited. Uh, there were less differences, more commonalities that just complemented each other. Oh, well, that's interesting. I wish that my school taught judo. I went to all female school and we did a social dance, unfortunately. <laughs> but I think boys do like a judo or kendo or something like that. You know, I don't know how it is there now, um, but I feel that I'm, not many things has changed. And, the, you know, it's incredible what your mother did and then Rusty did. You know, in the stone, it says that judo no haha. It doesn't say in America or anything. The Japanese judo community appreciated your mother as a mother of judo, you know, for the judo in general. She led the Japanese community, she led the American community, and she led all the female athletes and everyone. And it's so hard to break glass ceiling. And, you know, we take everything so granted. And we're still talking about you know, gender discrimination in sports in 2021. And she's been fighting for this for her entire career, not only for herself, but for the community. And, you know, I think her as a female, you know, and Japanese female, of course. And then, you know, from you, what advice do you have for women who are experienced barriers in any sport or field in which they are trying to advance? Well, one thing I, I learned from my mother early on is when you're being discriminated against, it's not your it's it's not your problem. You're not you're not guilty of being a woman. It's their problem. They don't know what to do. So a lot of times with discrimination, when somebody is threatened or their own inadequacies are going to be highlighted, they immediately fall where it's, their comfort level is, is discrimination. Well, if we keep them out, they'll go away. Well, we're here. We're here to stay. We're not going anywhere. And the Women's Sports Foundation and Billie Jean King and then the anniversary of Title IX, we're not going anywhere. So those that, that live for discriminatory practices, they really need to hear the message is we're not taking it any longer. We're not going to allow you to discriminate and we will do what it takes to make sure that there is equality for all. Yeah, keep voicing out and sending the message, right? And she did all that. And okay, so more questions. Why do you think Rusty was able to achieve so much in her life? Rusty was a very unique person because, again, she was just born a regular kid in Brooklyn. Uh, matter of fact, her name, Rusty, everybody thinks she took it because she had red hair. That, that wasn't the case. She was, actually took the name Rusty after a stray dog in her neighborhood because nobody wanted that dog. And that dog was hungry. That dog was abused. But you know what? That dog kept on getting up and coming back and coming back and would never give up. So she modeled herself after the personality of the dog, somebody who was hungry but never give up. And ultimately, I believe that dog even had some success. I think a family took that dog in. And Rusty saw that that is who she wants to be. Uh, Rusty had this unique drive, and I think everybody is born with their purpose. And some people, whether they know their purpose or they don't, uh, but Rusty was one of those people that knew 
that whatever was thrown her away was just part of her purpose. Taking her medal away from her in 1959, uh, like she told us in the video, she didn't dwell on it. She knew that not on her watch, this wasn't going to happen to another woman. And in 1959, when it was not something very familiar for women fighting for, for the equality, especially in a full contact sport, Rusty knew her purpose, that she needed to do something. And so many people say, oh, someone needs to do something. Well, my advice that to be successful like Rusty is be that someone who does that something. Don't just say it, do it. You have, Billie Jean King said, you have to see it to be it. Well, make sure you be it and then let others see it. Wow, that's some strong message coming from your, you know, your look. It's, it's great that you could send those messages yourself. You mentioned about finding the writer for the book and, you know, you became the best candidate writing the book. And, you know, she must be so glad that you are sharing her voice in the way that, you know, you could do in the most personal way. Um, okay, so more questions. Are there any successors to the Kyushu Dojo? Uh, well, Kyushu, Kyushu Dojo now is more of the spirit of Kyushu Dojo. It's not an active dojo any longer. Uh, some people have branched out into other dojos or opened their own dojos. Uh, they're always part of what we call the Kyushu family, the Kyushu Dojo family, no matter where they train. And they're part of the active part of other dojos, which are uh, very respectable dojos but they're always brothers and sisters of mine and of ours from Kyushu Dojo. So now Kyushu is more of a, uh, a spiritual adherence than a physical dojo. Oh. So more question, how would you recommend that current martial arts instructors integrate women's martial arts history in our Dojo Karate self-defense classes? Interesting. I, th I think it's so important. Uh, one of the things is for integrating history, I asked Rusty when we were writing this book, uh, before we publish it, do you want me to change anything? Do you want me to, to curtail it a little bit? And she said, absolutely not. Because you, if you erase history, there's a possibility history can repeat itself. And then the circle of misogyny can start over and over again. So it's so important for every martial art to incorporate some history of the, the history of the martial arts, the history of women in the martial arts. Uh, my partner at work is a historian and, and history is just so fascinating to know where we were and where we are today. And just to think about where we can be tomorrow. So history is so important to incorporate because that's also part of culture. When you're learning martial arts, it's not just the history, it's the culture. Right, it's the culture. Um, okay, so let me just see. I saw a message to Momi, okay. uh, because in the in the beginning I talked about the Nathan's hot dog eating contest. And I oh, asked, yes, I would say I asked the last, somebody, but you can go ahead. <laughs> I asked somebody to ask and, and Dr. Walker um, reminded me to talk about that. Uh, thank you. So the funny story to that is Rusty did everything she possibly can to bring media attention and bring attention to women's judo because the more attention we had to women's judo and the more press coverage that we had, the more popular she would think it would become. So as she's fighting for women's judo to be included in the Olympics, she can say, hey, here's all the press clippings. It's popular. People want to see it. We had the uh, West German junior judo team visit our dojo and stay with us for a few weeks in the summer. And that happened to have been uh, at the time when Nathan's was having a hot dog eating contest. So somebody she knew said, hey, you know what? Let's get two of the women in that contest just for publicity. Because of course, what better to have two uh, people from one from the US judo team and one from the German judo team go and enter the contest. It would be fun to see. Well, they, we're competitors by nature. And uh, not only did she enter myself and my friend Birgit Felden from, from Germany into the contest, Birgit took first place and I took second place. 
Now, granted, this is not the same time uh, and, and the same type of competitive eating like uh, when Kobayashi won or every, everybody else, but I'd still think it's respectable. Uh, Burgett ate, I think it was nine and a half hot dogs with the bun in about two minutes. And I ate nine hot dogs with the bun in two minutes. So uh, now forget it. I would be downing bottles of Pepsi or something, trying to even do, do something close. But what's funny is uh, Burgett and I always joke because that year, it was 1984, that we took first and second place, two females, two judoka, and coincidentally, we both have PhDs. So essentially, maybe hot dogs make you smarter when you're younger. Who knows? So that's an argument. Any kids listening to this, you can argue having a hot dog over grilled chicken and salad any day now and just tell them it makes you smarter. Well, coming from Brooklyn, that must have been a great publicity stunt. <laughs> um, okay, so we have some technical question. Uh, what is your opinion on the incorporation of judo waza in mixed martial arts? I don't really have an opinion about it. If, if the judo waza in mixed martial arts is, you know, what I understand about mixed martial arts is it's a mixed martial art. So if judo waza is incorporated in it, then that's just part of the mixture. From my understanding, it should, it's fair. And you know, if, if that's what you know, that's what you know. Uh, I don't really have that much information that I could speak uh, professionally about it, but that's just an assumption I'm making. Okay, another interesting question. It must be from somebody who's practicing. It seems many women leave judo when they have children and don't come back for lack of female partners. Has La Rusty left us with any lessons on how to make judo more accessible for women so they can stick with it? Well, one of the great things about judo is uh, judo toughens your body, toughens your mind, and toughens your spirit. So sometimes when women do leave judo and have children, they do come back. Uh, one of my training mates, Eve, had children and came back to judo. Uh, I believe Rhonda Rousey's mother, uh, Anne-Marie, had, had Rhonda and came right back to judo. And I have to tell you, my mother had her son from her first marriage and boom, right, come right back to judo. And after uh, my mom and dad had me, they, she came right back to judo. And uh, so I think women, if they really have the desire to step back on the mat after having children, and eventually sharing their experience of the mat with their children, that just enhances all of the judo practice and it perpetuates the spirit of judo and martial arts. Well, thank you. I think this is all for today. And there's some who share their personal experience in the chat. So Jen, I hope you can look back and just check those comments because there are some share like oh we were at the dojo in brooklyn and something like that so it must be nice to see those comments so thank oh, you all absolutely love to see them if you could share them with me i i can't see them oh yeah yeah no you can always go back and check the chat on the archive um okay so well thank you and i think we this is it for the question. So thank you for your answers to those questions. And thank you again to everyone who has joined us from all over the world. And we apologize if you didn't have time to get to your question. Um, if you have a moment, please fill out a short survey about this program. You can find a link in the description as well as in the chat. We appreciate your feedback and hope to see you again at future Japan Society programs. Thank you, Jing, and thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.